The message is called How the Mighty Fall and How They Get Back Up. So let's open up our Bibles. I'm going to read the entire chapter of 2 Samuel 11. Open up your Bibles so you can follow along. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11. In the spring of the year, by the way, I want you, as we're reading this passage, I want you to focus very attentively, just like you did during the murder mystery, right? Um, because, and, and actually this is a good point, you want to read your Bible the same way you watch that video. What does this mean? What is God saying here? You know, if you guys think we put a lot of thought into that video, Guess what? God has put a lot more thought into his word, right? So I want you guys to look as attentively into this passage and just in general when you read the Bible. God has thought behind every single word because it's all inspired. So 2 Samuel 11, in the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. Joab was his general. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, the city. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. He saw that he saw from the roof of a, from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, "Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite?" And so David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war was going. And then, then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Right? That's like a pretty statement for relax, be with your wife, spend the night with her. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. And when they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, that's like tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as you live and as your soul lives? I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then drop back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was, and as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned to Uriah to the place where he knew there, would, there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the servants of David among them, among the people fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger, when you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then, in the king's, uh, then if the king's anger arises, and if he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerushabeth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? 
Why did you go so near the wall? And then you shall say, Your servant Uriah is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. And the messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. And David said to the messenger, Thus shall you say to Joab, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one, now another. Strengthen your attack against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband, and, then, and when the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Notice that the only place where the Lord is, is in the chapter is literally the very last word. Interesting, huh? So what I want to talk about is how the mighty have fallen. What was the beginning of David's problem? The beginning of David's problem is found in the very beginning of this chapter. Read verse 1 again with me. In the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. What, what was the time of year? Spring. spring. What did the kings go out and do at that time? Do you know why they do that? Because it was then when the mud would dry out enough for the king's carriages and all their, you know, all their big, uh, you know, yeah, carriages that they had the wheels on, they would be able to transport all their equipment through the dirt because before that it was too muddy, it was too wet. So as soon as it dried up just a little bit, the kings every spring would go out and just keep fighting until it got muddy again, right? And that was just their way of life. That's what they did. You know, every year we go back to school, every spring they went to war. That was literally their life. Can you imagine how stressful that is? Right? It's like, oh man, just, I love winter break. <laughs> Very relaxed. But that was the way of life. That was what is what David was supposed to be doing. David was not doing what he was supposed to be doing. David was not where he was supposed to be. Ecclesiastes 3 1 says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Matthew 6 34, Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You see, God gives each and every one of us, listen to this, guys, God gives each and every single one of us something to do every single moment. In every season, in every time of our life, God gives us something to do. And if we refuse to be faithful in those little things, then we are headed towards sin. You see, we don't need to worry about what the future holds for us, what's going to happen there. We should think, we should plan. We don't need to worry. We don't need to stress out about those things. All we need to do is be faithful right here, right now, today. Jesus says, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Being faithful in the little. Luke 16, 10, Jesus says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in what? Much. And the one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. You see, David sinned. Before his sin, he was unfaithful in the little things. Well, actually, let's, let's go back to his life before he did this, before he sinned. If we look at his life, we see that he was actually faithful, right? He watched the sheep. Hey, that's not a glamorous job, right? He watched his father's sheep. That's nasty. It's stinky. You lose, you lose sleep. It, being a shepherd is not a romantic job. It's a very physically difficult job. And, and you're, you're there in the cold, you're there in the heat, and you're protected from the animals. But he was faithful. 
His dad later told him, hey, go take this stuff, go take some cheese over to your brothers who are at war. Go bring that, okay? Gets it and just goes and brings it. This little thing. David could have said, no, no, no. Dad, I want to do more important stuff. I want to rule a kingdom. I want to do this. And I said, okay, I need to carry some cheese. I'm going to carry some cheese. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. He, Saul said, play this instrument. He played the instrument. All these little things, he was faithful in them. And so we see how God started setting him over more. Right? David didn't even become the king of Israel all in one day. Did you know that? He became king of Judah, just one tribe. And only seven years later of continued faithfulness, God said, okay, it's time for you to rule the entire kingdom now, right? But somewhere, at one point, he stopped being faithful in the little things. He just sent his soldiers off to battle. You know, at this point, he's like, you know what, I'm, I'm good, I can relax. Why, why, why? I'm, I don't, I'm not needed there. And he just didn't join them. Look at verse 2, it says, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch. What time did David wake up? What time? Yeah. Noon. Afternoon. He woke up in afternoon. And isn't it crazy that it, it started with just sleeping in? It's these little things, it's these little steps. And I'm not saying sleeping in is a sin. Could be a sin. If you know that you need to be doing other things and instead you're sleeping in, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of the end, right? Again, it's these little things. And by the way, when he got up on his roof, you think when he seen, you know, before he seen Bathsheba, you think he didn't know that he could see a naked woman from his roof? Like, you think he didn't know that? You think someone randomly overnight built a shower, you know, in front of his palace, and it's like, oh, wow, who put the shower here, right? You think David didn't know these things? No, David absolutely knew the spot where he can get a peek, where he can, you know, see something, something that he was curious about. He knew he wanted to see it before he seen it. And he was probably telling himself, look, it's just looking. How bad can it possibly be? And the next step, notice in verse 3, all he did was just ask about her. He just asked, hey, who's this, who's this person? This, this lady showering. He's, he's, he's just asking. That's all he's doing. Like, how sinful and how bad is that? Just asking. Uh, look, I'm, I'm just curious. I'm wondering, I'm not doing anything wrong, he told himself. And then he sent messengers. To bring her, right? I just, I just want to talk to her. Hey, it's it's uh, the wife of Uriah, and Uriah, you know, he's my man. He's one of the guys who's fighting for me. He was actually one of his mighty men, right? And one of his thirty. He says, you know, I just want to invite her and encourage her while her husband's in battle. You know, just just make sure that you know if she's provided for, everything's good. That's what he was telling himself. Just, I just want to talk to her. And then finally, when she was in his presence and they were all alone, he ended up sleeping in with her, committing adultery. This entire time, guys, if you, again, like I said, look at the scriptures carefully, right? Study it like you would the murder mystery. You see that David was taking these tiny little steps. It didn't just happen randomly, right? It was tiny little steps. Luke 16, 10. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful much, and the one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. David was not watchful over the little things, and so they took him down in a huge way. And so the story continues to progress in little steps until he literally ends up murdering a man. I was talking to a friend who spent years in prison. And he has talked to a lot of murderers in prison. Like, these are people that kill people. They're people that are in there forever. They're never going to be out. And you know what he told me? He said almost every single person who committed murder, almost all of them, like, did not expect to kill somebody. They're like, that's just, that's not me. That's not 
That's not who I am. It just, it just happened. Almost nobody plans to be a murderer. And yet there's so many murderers in this world. You don't need a plan for a sin to happen. Sin will still come in. And it will happen if you are not faithful in the little things. And guys, this is what I want to ask you tonight. Are you being, examine your life. Examine your heart. Are you being faithful in the little things in your life? Or are you taking baby steps to help? God does not want or need you to become some full-time missionary or some person devoted to God, doing this, moving somewhere. That's not what God wants you to do right now. All He wants you to do is just be faithful with today, with what you have, with the rest of the, the four hours or the five more hours that you're going to be awake. That's all that God wants from you right now. And you all know in your heart what it is that God wants from you and what He doesn't want from you. Forget about the future. Just think about in this moment, what are the little things that God is calling you to be faithful in? And you know what? Becoming a missionary or some person, just a man or a woman of God that's fully devoted to God will be a natural outpouring of being faithful in the little things. Let me say that again. For God to use you in a big way will just be a natural outpouring of you being faithful in the little things. Guys, be faithful in the small things. Be faithful in the small increments of time that you have. Don't look at your life as just this huge, infinitely never-ending period of time, but look at your life as just, just increments of 15 minutes. That's it. Just 15 minutes. That's all you have. You don't know how long you're going to live. Ask yourself, how can I glorify God in the next 15 minutes? And maybe the answer to that question right now is like, I want you to listen to the rest of the sermon. After the sermon's over, I want you to worship me with all your heart. After that's over, I want you to go encourage somebody. Just go listen to somebody. Ask them how they're doing. Whatever it is, just ask yourself this question. How can I glorify God in the next 15 minutes? And don't worry about anything else. I'm not saying don't plan. Maybe God wants you to plan in the next 15 minutes. Whatever it is, ask yourself the question. If you want to do great things for God, be faithful in a little. Get off of your couch. Read the Bible. Maximize every 15 minutes minutes. The next problem we see is, we see it outlined in the chapter before that David had. If you read the chapter before, you know what it's talking about? Just someone read the heading. What is it? Someone call it out. David defeats the Ammonites. If you read the entire chapter, it's all about David's victories. It's like the peak. David has been established as king over Judah. David is established as king over Israel. David is just doing great. And now he has all these conquests, all this success, all these blessings, and he's doing great. But instead of giving that glory to God, Instead of continuing to be faithful, being humble, he started focusing on just pleasing his own self. He would say, you know what? I'm good. I attained all these amazing things. I got these great things for myself. Now I can just chill. I could just be on my couch. I could coast, right? I don't think that we as Christians can ever coast. There's no such thing as spiritual coasting. It's impossible. As long as we continue to live in this sin-filled world and this sinful flesh, we will never be able to spiritually coast. There are times when God gives us periods of spiritual rest, but never spiritual coasting. David thought he was good. David thought he was standing, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands... Be careful for fear that you might fall. 
If you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. The dangers of our successes, the dangers of our blessings, whether it be physical or spiritual, because you see, it's amazing, because the, David's victories were for the glory of God. The danger of those blessings, because we still live in a sinful flesh, is that we will try to attribute them to ourselves. We will try to think that, oh, I'm standing. Look at all these great things that just happened in my life. I'm standing. I'm good. I can coast. David thought he was good, and so he stopped being faithful in the little. He stopped being humble. He started to rely on his own self, and it was only a matter of time until Satan brought down even the one whom God referred to as the man after God's own heart. Think about that. You would think that David was so blessed and David was so spiritual that of all the people on earth, David would be able to say, you know what? Like, I'm good. I could take a little spiritual break, right? I could coast a little bit. I could relax a little bit. You'd think that the man of God, the man after God's own heart, that God referred to like that, would be able to take a little spiritual break and just, you know, stand a little bit on his own. You would think that. And yet, even Satan was able to even bring him down. So how much more us? Guys, how much less can we depend on our own spirituality? If we think we're good, be careful. So David was... He fell because he wasn't faithful in the little, and he wasn't attributing glory to God. He was became proud. He became self-reliant. That's why he fell. But now, a really important question is, how did he get back up? How did David not end up staying there in that spiritual low? Because you might be sitting here thinking, Peter, I'm, I'm back. I'm, I'm already down. I'm in the valley. I want to give you hope because David did recover from that. David did draw closer to God, and so can you. You see, we talked about David living for the audience of one. That doesn't mean he lived perfectly all the time, but that's the way that he lived, right? In the presence of God, everything related back to God. I want to please God. Everything else is a test, and everything relates back to God, whatever it is, good or bad. And because he lived before the audience of one, that helped him be more humble. Living in the presence of God helps us be humble, right? We read that passage, that chapter where he said, look, there was no mention of God. David didn't like pray to God about it first. David didn't do it. There is nothing. There is no presence of God until the very end where it says it displeased the Lord. But when we live in the presence of God, when we realize God's the only one sitting in the audience, it helps us stay humble because we realize it's not about me. It's not about my glory. It's not about me being on top of the world. It's about God and his glory. I want to read some verses for you from Psalm 131. This is David writing. He says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I don't occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Just look at the humility that David had when he was in the presence of God. He said, I don't occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. He's basically saying, I'm not thinking about things too big, too marvelous, too complex, some amazing things. Think about who's saying this. This is the king of the, one of the greatest nations at that time in the world. The king. Right? He, he's ruling the world, and he's saying... I'm not preoccupying myself with things too great. I'm not preoccupying myself with things too marvelous for me. I've calmed and quieted my soul like a winged child. There's nobody more dependent on parents than just a small child with its mother, right? Just a small, helpless, defenseless kid just, just sitting there enjoying its mother's presence. 
David the king, the mighty man who, who had killed hundreds of people with his own hand, right? This man, the, the manliest man that you can imagine, right? Bravest who went up against Goliath, this guy that was twice his size, and just ripped people in half and to shreds, right? And everybody was afraid of him. This guy, this manly man, is saying that I'm, I'm just, I'm like a weaned child. I'm like this little kid just sitting with my mom. How amazing is that? The king is like a mom. You know, you, you not like a mom. He's sitting with his mom, right? You'd think that David, being the king of this great nation and being this manly man, he would have compared himself to this hustler, right? That's just making moves, right? He's running his kingdom. He's expanding it. He's conquering. He's, he's making it happen, right? You'd think that that's what David was, would be comparing himself to, but instead he compares himself to this helpless child. That's the way he's seen himself. When he's in the presence of God, when he is humble before God, perhaps Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, when Jesus speaks to the crowd, is an echo of this psalm. I'm sure Jesus knew about this psalm when he said, and, I, and truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Children are dependent on their parents, especially small, small children. Small children, they're not smart. When you have a kid, you'll realize that they're not smart. Just... That's my daughter. Like, that's her form of entertainment, you know? It's very unsophisticated, let's call it that way. Children are not strong. They can't do anything. It takes humility. To see your own self, truly see your own self as just a small child. Especially when you are the king of the greatest country in the world at that time, right? That's humbling. Another example of David's humility, there's this, there's this passage when God appeared to David and he spoke to him and he said, he started telling David about all the different ways he would continue to bless David. And how he would use David and his lineage, right? And he would, he would set David's children on the thrones and they would rule and lead and they would do all these different things. And just this glorious future, he, God showed him this glorious future of David. 2 Samuel 7 verse 18, it says, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house? that you have brought me thus far. Look at the humility of David. Instead of saying, that's right, God, you know, you're right. You're right to bless me. This, Yeah, this makes sense, right? I, I did all these great things. I took over the kingdom. I killed Goliath. You know, I'm peaceful. I'm, I'm not a good king. Yeah, that makes sense. Of course you bless me. I mean, I, I would agree with that. Of course you're going to make my kids continue to rule. And instead, David comes in and just, sits before the Lord and says, Who am I? Who am I, O Lord, that you have promised such things and you have brought me thus far? David did not exalt himself in his heart, but instead he gave all the glory to God by walking in humility. David did not start to list all the different reasons of why he truly is qualified for all these great blessings. But instead, he's like, who am I? Who am I? He was extremely humble because he gave glory to God. Because God was always the center of his life. He was living for the audience of one, right? When you're living in the presence of God, you cannot be humble. Because you realize there is someone who will always be above you. There is someone who is always over you. There's always someone who is smarter and stronger and better than you are in every way, shape, and form. And because David was humble, he was able to repent. Connecting it back to his sin. You cannot have real repentance, guys. Listen to this. You cannot have real repentance without humility. 2 Chronicles 17, verse 14, 
14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, right? That's first. Shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The very first step to repentance is humbling ourselves. It's being in the presence of God and realizing that God is the great one and we are nothing, that God is amazing and we are sinful, and then we can repent of our ways and turn from our wickedness. You see, God told Nathan, the prophet, to go and expose David and to rebuke him for his sin, right? After that, after he did all that, God said, Nathan, go tell David. And do you realize that for Nathan, that command from God to go expose David was literally a death sentence? Do you, do you realize that? It was a death sentence. Here's this man who has killed hundreds of people with his own hand, right? With his own sword. Here's a man of war. Here's this man who is powerful, and he has the right to put you to death, and he doesn't need to have a reason. He doesn't need a reason. All he needs to say is, take his head off, and that's it. And people will go and do it immediately. This man holds ultimate power over the lives of all the people in the kingdom. And guess what? This person is in a very awkward spot. You're, gonna, you're about to put this very powerful person in a very awkward spot by calling him out. This guy just murdered someone to cover up his sin. Guess what he's probably going to do to you when he finds out that you know about the sin? Probably murder you too to cover the sin. This Nathan, I'm sure, was coming to David fully expecting that he's probably going to get killed. You need to expose him. He's going to be embarrassed. He's going to be angry. And I'm sure David did not have a lot of, Nathan did not have a lot of confidence that David would repent. And I'm sure it was a test for Nathan himself. But he needed to trust God, right? God, you know what you're doing. If you told me to deliver this message, that's my job. And Nathan knew probably about a lot of other prophets that lost their lives for saying the truth. But God knows what he's doing, right? And, and you know, you, you guys know that situation when a cat climbs up a tree and it can't get down, right? It's easy to climb up, but it just there's no way of getting back down. That's what happened. And this is where David was. He's like this cat. He climbs up really high, and everybody can see him. But the time came for him to come down, but he can't. Right? He can't come down. Imagine, guys, just think for a second. Step into the shoes of David. Think about how hard it was for David to admit his sin in that moment. To admit that he was wrong in what he did. David was the most powerful man in the world. And not only that, but he always talked about trusting God. Right? He wasn't just this ruthless king, but he talked about trusting God. He wrote songs. He encouraged people. He danced before the Lord. He worshipped God, right? He did all these things. He tried to live a righteous life. Always tried to do the right thing. That means people seen him as righteous. People looked up to him. People loved him and esteemed him. He led by example. And for people to find out this whole thing about David would basically mean David being exposed as just a hypocrite. Just think about how difficult it was for David to admit all these things. Think about all the rumors that would spread. Think about how many people wouldn't like him after they heard about this. In fact, he might even lose the kingdom because he's such a hypocrite, right? Everything is literally on the line for David here. David was way too high up on the ladder to come down. And he knew that if he fell, he would get hurt. David was too great to fail like this. But the complete unexpected happens. 2 Samuel 12, 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I 
have sinned against the Lord. You see, despite all this pressure that the world was putting on David to not repent, to hide his sin, to uphold his reputation and his image. You think we have great reputations and images? Just think about the reputation that David had and the image that David carried with himself, right? With great responsibility, with great power comes great responsibility. With a great image came great potential to fall. And that's what David had. Think about all the pressure going against him, and yet he still humbles himself, repents of his sin, admits his fault. Why? Because David, he says it, I have sinned against the Lord. David didn't start thinking about his image. David didn't start thinking about his position, his kingdom, and what would people think. What he started thinking is, well, what does God think about all this? And you know what? It's, it was very clear to David in that moment. He knew exactly what God thought about him. And David didn't give it any other thought. Oh, how about this, 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 this? No, no, no. None of that matters. The question is, what does God think? And the answer was very clear. God didn't like it. And so David does what, we, what, what seems almost impossible. You see, when it's just you and God in the room, then you're never too great to fail. When it's just you and God in the room, there's no image to uphold. There's no reputation to show off. There's none of that. I love this. There's a, there's a phrase. They say, you know, we need to focus on our character and God will take care of our reputation. Right? Focus on your character. God will take care of your reputation. Focus on your relationship with God and he will take care of the rest. God is great. You are not. I'm not. None of us are. We're all human. We're all sinful. And you can always repent before Him. No matter how great we are in the eyes of people, as long as we are in the presence of God. David's secret to repenting despite the immense pressure not to repent was humility. You guys realize that it is our pride that stands between us in our repentance, between us and us restoring our relationship with God. It's our pride, oftentimes, to uphold a particular image to people. It's our pride that stops between that. Proud people never repent. Do you, do you, have you ever noticed that? Proud people cannot repent. But the humble are always repenting. They're always admitting their fault. They're always coming before God. They're always saying, to people, look, I messed up. I said something wrong. I shouldn't have done that. But we we worry, right? We worry. What are people going to think? What are my friends going to think? My parents are going to think. What will people say about me after this? And in our pride, we continue to make ourselves try to try to make ourselves look great instead of humbling ourselves before God. When we are proud, we are the center of the world, and God is either on the side or not in the picture at all. But when we live for the audience of one, when he is in the center, we are on the side. We are on the bottom, and we become humble. And when we're humble, there's no expectation for us to be perfect. And repenting makes sense. Only Jesus is perfect. Nobody else, guys. Nobody else. Only Jesus Christ. And that should be liberating. That should be so liberating that nobody is perfect. And you shouldn't expect yourself to be perfect. You shouldn't expect to uphold a perfect image. Don't try to take the place of Jesus. Don't compete with Him. Just stay humble. Do not let your pride keep you from repenting before God and restoring your relationship. You know, we go free diving. I don't know if you guys know what free diving is. It's, it's diving in the ocean or, you know, maybe some lake. Uh, with, you know, we got a wetsuit because it's usually really cold. And there's no tanks. We don't have any air tanks because when we would dive for abalone, it's these big, like, sea animals that we catch them and we eat them and they're delicious. And it's quite an experience because 
you can't have a tank, it's illegal, right? So it's just, it's one breath. It's the beauty of one breath. And you just, you're just floating on top of the water, just relaxing yourself, slowing down your heart rate, because the slower your heart rate is, the slower your oxygen will be consumed. And you're just breathing there, you're breathing, you're breathing. And when it's slow enough, you just, you pick up your legs, because again, minimal movement. You pick up your legs and they push you into the water. It takes almost no energy. And you start floating down and you start kicking, kicking, kicking. Next thing you know, you're about 25 feet underwater. And you're, and you're in the Pacific Ocean, it's freezing cold. And I'm, I'm coming down and I see there's, there's seagrass growing everywhere. And I'm thinking, oh, there's no abalone here because abalone, they like to hide you know, between the cracks and the crevices and they stick there. And you're like, oh, there's nothing here. And then you're swimming in and, and all of a sudden you see between the grass, there's a, there's a sea trench. There's a trench in the ocean. And you just grab the side and you pull yourself in and it's deep. You go in, grass covers you and you just start crawling through this trench and you're looking for this abalone. And all of a sudden you see this, you see this abalone and it's like you get 10 more seconds of breath in that moment, you know? Like, ooh, the prize, the Easter egg. And you swim up slowly to not disturb it, right? Because if you disturb it, it'll just clamp up and you will never take it off. You swim up, you just, you get in position, you have this bar and you just come in and then just, boom, you yank it off, grab that thing and you start swimming up as fast as you can because you're running out of air. And it's the most beautiful thing because it's, it's this bright yellow color underwater. The muscle is a bright yellow color and it's got these little holes on the side and they start bleeding as you pull them up, but they're bleeding like this light blue blood, you know, it's just, it's, it's, un, it's this unreal experience. And as you, as you swim up, you, you spit out your trupka and you're just like, and you just start breathing again because, I mean, you're holding your breath the entire time. You've got one breath. That's all you have, right? Now, imagine you're on this boat, you're free diving with me, right? We go to Ocean Cove, we're free diving, and we've got a pound of, we've got 50 pounds of gold. That's a lot of money. That's about a million dollars. A million dollars will really change the way you live your life if you get a million dollars, right? Completely change the course of your life. There's a million dollars in this 50 pounds, and all of a sudden the boat tips and the gold falls off. You're gonna jump in after. You're gonna grab it. But guess what? You ain't pulling that 50 pounds out. It, you, you could fight it as much as you want. You could fight it as much as you can, but it will still pull you down slowly but surely all the way down until it just holds you there and you run out of air and you perish trying to hold on to this thing that you think is going to help you. You think this thing that will help you live this great life but in reality, it's this thing that actually ends up killing you. Because if you do not let go, you will die. There's no way you can keep your life and the goal. And you have to choose. And it's both the hardest and the easiest decision in your life. It's the easiest because you know exactly what the answer is. It's the hardest because it's emotionally just so difficult. You cannot keep your pride in your image and repent and restore a relationship with God. You can't have both worlds. And believe me, repentance, humility, and having a relationship with God is totally worth it. Because you're not just keeping your physical life, you're keeping your eternal life. You have to pick. You have to repent. In conclusion, you know, if you guys think 2020 was hard, I want you to rethink that. This past Christmas day, literally Christmas, we we're, were getting ready to go to my parents to go celebrate Christmas with them. And I was home, you know, wrapping some stuff up. And I received a call that I wasn't ready to receive. It was my wife. She called me. She's like, hey, babe. I'm like, hey, what's up? And because, you know, I know she was going to be back home in a second. And we're going to pack up and we're going to leave. I'm like, hey, what's up? And she's like, hey, Jay died. I'm like, what? Who? What? 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 She's like, Jay died. 
Jay was our neighbor. It's this guy that greeted us the very first day we moved into our apartment. This old ex-military guy, always jolly, always encouraging. You know, he, he helped, you know, Vera get back into the apartment when she, you know, locked her keys out and, and just, you know, willing to let us borrow his truck. I mean, it's just this guy was super nice, super kind, always just like giving us like encouraging little pep talks. You know, when, when we're going through hard stuff, and it was just, it was surreal. It was this shock. And I don't know if any of you have ever experienced, like, death uh, of a close one, of a person you know. But it was so weird, because we're about to go and celebrate Christmas with my family. And it's this feeling of death. Our neighbor of five years, just, he's dead. And if you think 2020 was hard, I want you to rethink that. You're here. You're still alive. You have a pulse. You made it through 2020 alive. Other people didn't. I don't know if Jay repented before he died. He wasn't a believer. We definitely talked to him about God many times. Didn't want to hear it. I mean, he was, he was nice. He was courteous. But his time is over. That's it. The, the, there's no more time for him. Now is your time. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, today is the day of salvation. Today is your time. I look, after he died, I looked back at my texts, I scrolled all the way up, you know, and I seen he wished us a Merry Christmas last Christmas. He wished us a Happy Easter. He congratulated us with the birth of our child in February, but he never made it to this Christmas. 2020 was the last year that God gave him. That was it. His life is gone. He's in eternity. And now it's your time. Repent. Turn to God. Lest you likewise perish in your sins. The last verse I want to read for you is James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God, and he will exalt you. Let's pray.